left on the dock for more than 24 hours will be compressed to a cube at the owner's expense. Welcome to Sacred Cow Shipyards. I feel reasonably comfortable in assuming that most, if not all, of my audience knows what an SSBN is, but just in case. They are otherwise known as ballistic missile submarines, or perhaps boomers. No, not that kind of boomer, the other kind of boomer. And the designation came by way of the SS standing for submarine, the B standing for ballistic missile equipped, and the N indicating that it is nuclear powered. These boats, because yes, remember, all submarines are boats, no matter how large or small they are, are typically considered to be part of their country's nuclear triad. What the f*** is that? Well, basically, if nuclear war were to break out on your planet, most of your countries have three primary methods of delivering weapons. First, they have strategic bombers, such as the B-52. Then they have ground-based launch systems, such as the Minuteman system. And finally, of course, they have the sub-base systems, the ballistic missile submarines. The assumption with the triad is that even if you were the recipient of a first strike, a strike that you knew absolutely nothing about, you had no idea it was even coming, that strike would only be able to take out one, maybe two of the points of the triad. You would still have something that you could hit back with. And yes, 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 I know right now you're already trying to think about how aircraft take time to spool up and get off the ground and blah, 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 so on and so forth. No joke, the USAIANS actually used to keep B-52s in the air all day long, 24-7, not the same bird, of course, they would have to rotate them out, with nukes on board during the Cold War. In fact, they lost a couple nukes that way. And then, of course, the bunkers for the, the ground-based launch systems were very heavily hardened, although now you can buy them as residences, which is kind of fascinating on some level and very perverse, but that's humans for you. And then, of course, the submarines. Well specifically the ballistic missile submarines, because they are very different from fast attack submarines. Fast attack submarines, their whole job is to go out there, find things, and kill them. Ballistic missile submarines' whole job is to go out into the ocean and disappear. They, at least in the USAIN's case, are typically deployed for about three months on a blue-gold system. That is to say, each submarine actually has two crews, and they rotate out when the sub comes in, do their training while the sub is out with the other crew, and vice versa, so on and so forth. And while they're out there, they are given a box that they are supposed to be staying in. But beyond that, no one really knows where they are except them. And they spend three months cutting donuts in the ocean and hopefully never, ever, ever being noticed, seen, observed, or quantified in any meaningful fashion. Now, yes, they can receive messages from the shore. In fact, we talked about that a little in the episode where we also talked about that little tiny tin can submarine that was smooshed next to the Titanic. But typically, they don't send messages themselves, except very infrequently at certain times to check in and basically say, hey, yes, verily, we are still alive. And of course, one of those messages that they can receive is, you know, of course, the launch command, the one that no one ever actually wants to hear, because submariners, particularly have this horrid reality if the launch command has ever come down to them, because that means things have gotten hot upstairs in the real world, and when they surface, there's not going to be much for them to go back to. Unlike, say, the, the ground launch crews or the aircraft crews who may just be incinerated in a fiery ball, the submariners will almost certainly survive, and then they have to figure out what to do. But enough maudlin nonsense. Did you know that all current submarine-launched ballistic missiles are not, in fact, launched from the surface. In fact, they can't be. Yes, yes, early in the submarine launch ballistic missile programs that all these various countries had, they were actually launched while the sub was surfaced. That is no longer the case, and if you were to attempt it now, you would actually destroy the missile and the sub, because the uh, missile motors have gotten strong enough that they would just blast through the bottom of the, the hull. It'd be very bad. And before we go any further, I will just want to clarify that I will be talking specifically about the USS Ohio class of submarines that the USA and use, as well as their UGM-133A Trident II missile, otherwise known as a Trident D5, which is different from the Trident I, which was known as the C4. Uh, a little confusing there, but anyways, the, there's more information about those on your injured tubes than anything else, so that's what you get stuck with. It's not like I have a back door into any kind of nuclear launch systems. Of course not. Who would think that? 
Anyways, like I was saying, these missiles are actually launched from underwater, as crazy as that sounds. Typical launch depth is somewhere around 100 feet at the keel, so eh, call it like 70 feet at the hatch. And yeah, they are no joke launched underwater, and I'm not even making that up. You can probably believe that. You're probably not going to believe the next part. When the Trident comes out of the water, it is almost literally dead bone dry. Nope, I am not making that up. And yes, I did in fact say that the missile was launched from underwater. So how the f*** does that work? Well, when an SSBN's hatches, missile hatches, are open, what you see sticking up out of the tube is not actually the missile. Now, every country does this a little differently. The USA, and specifically, keep the missile in a canister. There's actually a whole pile of reasons to do this, notably that it makes the missile lighter, or you have to dedicate less weight to the structural integrity of the missile. Because if you have hard points that you can grab on the missile, those have to be pretty strong. Whereas you're, if you're just carrying the missile around in a can, it doesn't really matter. The can has to be strong, but the missile can be whatever you want it to be. It just has to withstand the launch forces. Also, this sheath keeps the water out until the missile is actually fired. Again, various countries do this a variety of different ways, and in the Trident's case, it actually amusingly uses a small rocket motor on the submarine that the exhaust is fed through chilled water, which of course immediately blasts it into steam, which is then shot into the envelope that the missile is resting in, and pushes that whole missile through the top seal of the, the tube and up into the air. And again, yes, you did hear that right. You did hear me say that the submarine is about 100 feet, so just call it 100 feet regardless. And this steam explosion coming out of the missile tube is enough to not only launch the missile, it's also keeping it enveloped in steam, as in like dry steam, not like wet steam from your pots, but dry air for all intents and purposes. And it pushed hard enough that this whole bubble enveloping, encompassing the missile comes up to the surface and launches it into the air. The crazy thing is that the Trident's main motor does not actually fire until the Trident starts falling back down again. This is a specific design decision. The crazy thing about sub-launched ICBMs is that they have to work every time. So simple solutions are often the best. In this case, it's simply an inertial switch. As the missile is going up inside of its bubble envelope, the switch is disengaged, but as soon as it peeks out on its little apogee with like, I don't know, 20 feet over the water and starts falling back down, the switch flips up and, oh, motor needs to come on. Click. Whoosh. Off we go. There's no remote triggering. There's no significant electronics involved. It is all stupid simple. I mean, even going down the simplistic path even further, these ICBMs, of course, don't have fins. They just have thrust vectored engines. And in most cases, they use solid rocket propellant. The USA and ones in specific have a three-stage system that is solid rocket all the way through. The Soviets, of course, had to get experimental and have mixed solid rocket and liquid uh, rocket, as well as just purely liquid rocket systems. And those are just a nightmare to maintain, but that's a whole separate conversation. And then unlike her predecessors, the Polaris and Poseidon missiles, the Trident missile has a remarkably blunt nose. And it was observed in testing and development of the missile system that this was affecting aerodynamic stability as well as top speed. And I mean, top speed matters when you want to reach, you know, 7,500 miles or so. The solution? A spring-loaded spike. Once again, not making this up. Shortly after the first stage lights off, the Trident 2 actually deploys a no-joke aerospike out of its nose, which apparently reduces drag by 50%. Basically what it does is as it passes through the sound barrier, it moves the shockwave ahead of the missile so that the air believes that the missile is much more streamlined than it actually is, so it drags on it less. Simple solution, once again. But the simplest solution, great maker almighty, if you believed anything before, you are definitely not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. The simplest solution actually comes by way of its navigation. Because, of course, this missile has to know where it's going, right? And more importantly, this missile is being launched during a global thermonuclear war, as Whopper would call it. Probably with less expression in his voice, though. Oh, well. Anyways, at that point, you can't really trust anything. I mean, the enemy could be spoofing GPS signals. They could have just shot all the GPS satellites down. That's not too hard. It is kind of hard given your current technology. But the good news is that the GPS satellites are literally constantly broadcasting the location. I mean, they're constantly broadcasting. That's how GPS works. So sending a missile off to go chase that signal down is not hard. It's just mostly a question of whether or not the missile has legs to get to it. But that's beside the point. You can't trust anything. 
So how do you get this missile from the middle of nowhere in some ocean to some major city in some country that I probably shouldn't name? Well, the answer is the Mark VI Astro Inertial Guidance System. And yes, again, you did hear those words correctly. The good news is the submarine knows exactly where it is. It has to, otherwise it's going to run into things that it really shouldn't run into. So when the missile is being prepared to launch, the submarine's navigational computer and the navigational computer on board the missile are constantly exchanging information, letting the missile know where exactly they are the moment it is fired. And at that point, the Trident's onboard inertial guidance system takes over. Now, inertial guidance systems are a very complicated topic, probably deserving of their own episode, but they basically boil down to accelerometers and gyroscopes and a very good computer doing very complicated math and given a starting point and then figuring out where they are now after all the various accelerations and rotations they've detected are filed and logged and calculated appropriately. And that inertial guidance system is doing its math as the missile is making its descent and leaving the atmosphere. And once it leaves the atmosphere, the astro side of the house takes over. The missile does a little roll, points a camera at the heavens, and sees where the stars are. And no, I am not joking. It literally uses constellation geometry and celestial navigation to figure out where it is, where it's going, and whether it's going the right direction or not. Again, not joking. Because honestly, on your planet, you can be reasonably certain that even during a global thermonuclear war, the stars aren't going to move. One of them's not going to go out. I mean, they do that frequently. I mean, the stars are constantly moving. But from your perspective, in those moments between the data was uploaded into the computer, and then it took a star shot and saw where the hell it was, they didn't move that much. I mean, they did, but not relative to you. You know what I'm saying. And stars can't be jammed. They can't be shot down. They can't be destroyed. I mean, the, the one of the terminal guidances of the Tomahawk system is actually terrain mapping. And if you bomb the ever-loving hell out of a location hard enough, it might get kind of confused when it took a picture and was like, what the hell is that? Tridents don't care. They look at the stars, they adjust course appropriately, they line up on their target, and they release their mervs. And I suppose that's where the real entertainment comes in. Any given trident can carry up to 12 W88 warheads in their reentry vehicles. And each of those warheads can put 475 kilotons of hurt on whatever they hit. Or alternatively, they can carry up to 14 W76s, which only do 100 kilotons. Yeah. And I want to point out, want to stress before we get to what kilotons mean and how that compares to other things, that they can put this hurt onto a target with an accuracy of 100 meters. Yes, you heard that right. They are accurate to within a football field or a soccer pitch, whatever those are called. Yes, it's that small of an accuracy. And this is after the warheads have traveled somewhere in the neighborhood of 7,600 miles. I don't even know how to calculate the minute of angle accuracy for that distance and that degree of accuracy. I mean, we're talking about warheads that the joke is close only counts in horseshoes, hand grenades, and nuclear devices. And so, I mean, if you're within a mile or so, it'll probably do what you want it to do. But I don't know. We're going to do 100 meters. That's good enough. And all of this from inertial guidance and star shot. And I guess I should actually remind people that those 14, 12 to 14 warheads can be independently targeted. They aren't all hitting the same target. As long as their 12 to 14 targets are all in the same general direction, the MERV release platform can actually just point them in, in their appropriate directions and let them go and let them do their thing. And these things re-enter at Mach 24. That's about 18,000 miles an hour or 29,000 kilometers an hour. Yeah. The mass starts getting crazy at that point, man. Now, to loop back to something I said previously, a kiloton is a unit of measurement that is equivalent to a thousand tons of TNT all going off all at once simultaneously. This is actually really hard to do because if you have a single fuse, then the initial explosion will scatter the TNT to the point where the rest of it won't go off. But just imagine for the sake of principle that you could set off a thousand tons of TNT simultaneously. That is a kiloton explosion. Now, to start small, the GBU TAC-43-B Massive Ordnance Air Blast Bomb is literally only 11 tons of TNT equivalent. It's not literally 11 tons of TNT, but the explosive power is equivalent to 11 tons of TNT. 
Now, of course, the Massive Ordnance Air Blast can be acronymized as MOAB, which it can be expanded to the mother of all bombs, which it kind of is, at least in the conventional sense. Although amusingly, that whole thing is referred to as a snow clone, which is a term I didn't know until recently, but apparently it's a cliche that can be used and recognized in multiple variants and is apparently based on the massive number of terms that the Inuit would have for snow. In other words, it can expand into multiple different terms at the end, I suppose. Interesting language you guys have. Anyways, moving up from there, the little boy bomb dropped on Hiroshima during World War II had a yield of 15 kilotons. Oh yeah, we moved from tons to kilotons that quickly. And it was a fairly primitive gun-type bomb chosen because if it fizzled, it wouldn't make that big of a mess. On the other hand, Fat Man was an implosion-type device that would make a mess if it fizzled, and it was 21 kilotons. And you want to know the real joke? And I'm somewhat amused this did not actually come up in the Oppenheimer movie that I'm sure everyone watching this channel has probably already seen at this point, but the gadget set off at Trinity in New Mexico in the USA in province? Yeah, that thing was 25 kilotons. That thing was bigger than both of the atomic bombs dropped in your current history. I guess they dialed it down a touch. Or they weren't sure it was going to work, so we might as well throw everything at it, right? Which is honestly what kind of what happened. So yes, anyways, the biggest nuclear bomb dropped on your planet in anger so far is all of 21 kilotons. And a single Trident II missile can carry up to 12 475 kiloton warheads. And a single boomer, a single SSBN, a single ballistic missile submarine can carry up to 20 of those so equipped tridents, which are bone dry despite being launched underwater and use star shots to figure out where they are and where they're going. Like I said, sometimes simple solutions are the best. And that's all from Sacred Cow Shipyards. Please be advised that any ship left on the docks for more than 24 hours will be compressed to a cube at the owner's expense. Have a nice day.